America's pastime is one of the oldest organized sports in existence, with Major League Baseball spanning back to the year 1876. Minor League Baseball stems back to September 5th of 1901, and nearly 123 years later, there are a select few stadiums that give you a true glimpse into the sport's history. At number 10, we have Nat Bailey Stadium. Technically, there are two ballparks tied at the 10th spot, so you get a bonus venue. Nat Bailey Stadium is home of the Vancouver Canadians in the Blue Jays system, opened in 1951, and it was originally referred to as Capilano Stadium. Construction cost was $550,000 at the time. That equates to about $6.3 million in today's value. The name change happened in 1978 in order to honor the great Nat Bailey, a diehard baseball supporter who played a pivotal role in promoting baseball throughout the city. This place has hosted minor league all-star games, playoff series, and various other promotional events. There are recorded renovations from the 1970s, 2007, and even as recent as 2011, 13 years ago. Those include everything from improving seating conditions to installing modern, up-to-date amenities. Even with all of the changes, the priority is clear. Preserve the historical and classical look, and I think they've accomplished that here. First Energy Stadium was also constructed in the year 1951. It was originally referred to as Reading Municipal Memorial Stadium, that was named in honor of U.S. troops who had made the ultimate sacrifice while serving our country. It's home to the Reading Fightin' Phils, the AA affiliate of the Phillies, and it has been since the year 1967. Legendary corner infielder Mike Schmidt actually made his professional baseball debut at this ballpark back in 1971. He did so in an exhibition game between the Philadelphia Phillies and the Reading Phillies. The structure was put up for an improvement plan back in 2021, and they've tacked on some pretty sweet additions. Anytime there's a pool that serves as bleacher seating, you can count me in. This stuff is glorious, and I can't wait to get in one of those. Granger Stadium comes in at number 9 in our list. It was built back in 1949 for just $170,000, so, you know, a modest-looking house, or $2.2 million in today's value. Bonds were issued to raise money for the majority of these funds, and the name Granger comes from the donor of half of the cost of the original piece of land where this field is now plotted. That would be Jesse Willis Granger. We'll give him his flowers. The Down East Wood Ducks, the single-A affiliate of the Rangers, play here now, but over the years, teams like the Kinston Eagles and Kinston Expos played professional baseball in this location as well. It's a more intimate setting, there's no doubt about that. The capacity sits around 4,100 spectators. The overhang behind home plate gives this place a more vintage feel, without a doubt as well. It's also just 390 feet to center field here, so someone who can belt one to dead center gets a slight advantage compared to the majority of other ballparks that make it a mark of 400 feet even. Funko Field rolls in at number 8, and I'm also just about to declare Funko as... One of the more fun words to say in all the landmarks that we're covering here today, this venue is one of the most unique out there. So construction happened back in 1947, and this place currently houses the Everett Aqua Sox. But this ballpark is actually part of a larger sporting complex, referred to as Everett Memorial Stadium. So the Everett School District owns this property and utilizes both stadiums for their own events. They got the land from the Everett Lodge of Elks 479 in memoriam, of Everett citizens who gave their lives in World War II. There's a football field nearby, with a capacity four times the size of Funko Field. The Canadian Football League had a preseason game there in 1967. The BC Lions took down the Edmonton Eskimos 7-2 in a game with no touchdowns, so maybe the end zone didn't work quite yet. It's a pretty close setup, so if you're in the area in the late summer to early fall stages of the year, it might be possible to see a football-baseball doubleheader. Now that sounds like a blast. Let's jump over to the West Coast, where you'll find Valley Strong Ballpark, a 78-year-old ballpark built for a measly $50,000 at the time. But don't let that initial value fool you. $11.6 million have been spent over the course of three different facelift renovations, one being in 1967, one in 2002, and the most recent in the year 2009. In the same year as that last renovation, the Visalia Rawhide began to occupy the space and have been there ever since. With just 1,888 
permanent stadium seats and a listed capacity below 2,500, Valley Strong is the smallest MLB-affiliated ballpark. This is an intimate setting. The grandstand behind the plate houses the majority of seating, and beyond that, think Little League settings. You try and find a place along either railing and get the best view you possibly can. While the ballpark capacity may be small, you've got to hit it a long way to leave the yard here. It's 405 feet to dead center field and 365 in both the left and right center field power alleys. Let's get pumped and head to Excite Ballpark in San Jose, California. The stadium broke ground in 1941 and was open to the public a year later. This place has been the home of 12 different teams since its inaugural season, but currently it hosts the San Jose Giants and the San Jose State Spartans for some NCAA ball. Structurally, this was one of the first stadiums to ever be built entirely out of reinforced concrete, and it originally operated on the name San Jose Municipal Stadium. Some of the traditions here are phenomenal. Mid-inning entertainment includes a tire toss, a child foot race around the bases, and this concept called Smash for Cash. Let's dive into this. Players are attempting to smash the headlights of an old delivery truck to split a $50 prize with a lucky fan. What an idea. Creativity is off the charts there. A laundry list of legends have called this place home in the past with Joe Nathan, two-time Cy Young winner Tim Lincecum, and even Buster Posey being a couple of notables. While you're at this venue, maybe give Turkey Mike's a chance as well if you're into the barbecue scene like I am. We're back to the year 1940 now with Bank of the James Stadium, referred to as City Stadium for its inaugural season. Then it was Calvin Falwell Field at City Stadium in 2004, and since 2020 it has operated under its current name. This is another very unique setup because City Stadium is now an adjacent football field that shares the property and houses 6,000 spectators. More doubleheader football opportunities in the early fall. The Lynchburg Hillcats call this place home, and might I say, it is beautiful. You've got the bricks surrounding the backstop area, indicating this place has some miles on it. And maybe I'm just a nature nerd, but can you imagine the colors of all of those trees in the backdrop as baseball season transitions from late spring to the early phases of autumn? That is glorious. Let's back up nine more years to modern Woodman Park, built way back in 1931 and still standing quite strong. The Quad Cities River Bandits play their affiliated ball here, and St. Ambrose University plays here in the spring. This place is on the banks of the Mississippi River, and my goodness, doesn't this entrance just look like that of baseball royalty? Go inside of the park itself, and it gets even better. There's that big, beautiful river beyond center and right field. The operations crew manicures this grass in phenomenal fashion, and in left field, hello, Ferris wheel. This feels like a ballpark I would construct in MLB this show. If you're a minor league player, I feel like there's nothing more you'd want than to crush a ball to left field and right into one of those Ferris wheel baskets. If I might direct your attention down the first baseline, there is a picturesque view of a bridge as well. There aren't many places out there that'll integrate a city with its ballpark quite like this one. The Midwest League All-Star Games were held here at Modern Woodman Park not too long ago. Legends from the Negro League, like Satchel Paige, have also stepped onto this very historic field. McCormick Field is rich in history, and why wouldn't it be, considering it opened back in 1924? This 100-year-old relic plays host to the Asheville Tourists, and the backyard baseball view invites nature right into the venue. That's just a segment of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. We have told the story in a different video before. Babe Ruth was supposed to play here in 1925, collapsed when getting off the team train right before a game, went to the doctor, had quite the stomach bug, and people started spreading the rumor that the great Bambino had passed away. Six years later, he and his buddy Lou Gehrig came back and sent a couple of missiles into the Blue Ridge Mountain landscape in the third inning of a game in 1931. McCormick Field also housed some NASCAR races. They had the racing scene there with the concrete oval inside the field of play back in the 1950s. And there is the Asheville Memorial Stadium housing a football and soccer facility behind this field. It is only 297 feet to that right field foul pole. So there is a 36 foot wall to bring what would usually be a pretty easy home run down that end closer to modern standards. The second oldest active minor league ballpark is Lecom Park in Bradenton, Florida. Consider this the Hollywood Walk of Fame for baseball. So many different teams have been housed here as well. The Cardinals were here in the 1930s during the Gas House Gang era. Story time, why is it called that? Because Hall of Famer Dizzy Dean, who played here in the 30s, 
said he loved Bradenson so much that he bought a local gas station and would hang out there when he wasn't on the diamond playing baseball. The United States did use this field as a training base during World War II. I mean, this strip of land has seen it all, right? As the oldest stadium still used for spring training, this area has seen the legendary backstop Johnny Bench, Vladimir Guerrero, Roberto Clemente, Babe Ruth himself, and last year the 2023 number one overall pick in the draft. In Paul Skeens made some appearances. Now he's looking like one of the best arms in baseball. There are decent shade spots up both lines since Florida gets pretty hot. Got to keep those fans cool. From a capacity standpoint, you can't help but be impressed at the effort from this Florida organization to expand. In 1923, the capacity was 2,000. And it was 6,600 by 1993. Now, it stands at a phenomenal 8,500 spectators. Jackie Robinson Ballpark is the oldest minor league ballpark still in use. And the Daytona Tortugas call it home. A legendary staple like this deserves a legendary name. And obviously a man who helped break the color barrier in baseball fits the bill perfectly. Originally known as City Island Ballpark, the stadium opened up back in 1914, just 13 years after minor league baseball started. With a set of wooden bleachers for spectators from around the area for that inaugural year, Hurricane Donna decimated the area, including this ballpark, in 1960, and the modern grandstand portion of the facility, as well as the press box, were built in 1962. In 1998, the stadium was put on the United States National Register of Historic Places. It's right on the water, it is glorious, and it gives you that blast to the past feel once you enter the concourse. Naturally, it's a must-visit for all baseball diehards. To know that out of the 120 minor league stadiums, this is the best representation of the early stages of a sport that we all love, it's pretty mesmerizing if you think about it. Those are the 10 oldest minor league stadiums still being used in affiliated ball today. We did another video on the 10 best ballparks in minor league baseball. Highly recommend you check that out. And this channel is all about the minor leagues as a whole, so make sure you subscribe if that's up your alley. Otherwise, we will see you in the next one.